Hi, welcome to Ace on Sunday Mornings. My name is Perry Furness. I'm part of our adult Christian education team at St. John's Lutheran. And uh, welcome to this series. Welcome to this journey that we've been on for several weeks now. This is part three of a three-part series, we'll actually, which will actually turn into four parts. Uh, the first three parts are video clips. An intro, uh, several video clips um, by staff at St. John's, uh, laypersons around St. John's faith community, and then people from beyond St. John's faith community. And this is in response to the question, how do you live out your faith in your work life, in your career choice? And how does God's presence uh, present itself in the way you interact with people, in the way you set your priorities, in the way you make choices in going about your work? And how does all of that impact people around you and the world around you too? So we've been on this journey and it's been exciting and it's, it's been, I think, engaging and inspiring. It, it helps us kind of look at our own lives and, and think about that a little more deeply. And, and uh, I hope it's been good for you. We've enjoyed doing this. Um, like I say, the fourth part will be a Zoom call and that's October 25th, 10.45 a.m. That's a Sunday morning. And uh, Pastor Andy and Brooks and myself will be on that call. And I hope a number of the people who've, who've done the video clips, uh, and I can't on behalf of the team, thank you so much for all your contributions. It's, it's uh, for some of us, speaking for myself, it's a challenge to be in front of a camera and to tell, uh, give us a, a slice of your faith story in, in your work life. It's pretty awesome. So we really appreciate this and uh, it's, it's been so good. So thank you. And uh, we look forward to continuing this today. Look for Pastor Andy's synthesis at the end of this uh, clip. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the Zoom call on Sunday, October 25th. Uh, enjoy the, the series. Thanks. Hello, it's nice to be able to connect with you. And thank you, Andy, for this invitation. Andy asked me to uh, just record a few minutes on my thoughts around this really simple question about how faith has guided my career, my work life, my daily life. And as I thought of that easy question, I immediately went back to my childhood because I believe all faith formation kind of starts in the beginning. And I am from a small town in central Wisconsin. Uh, that means I'm a Packer fan. So sorry, Andy, go Pack Go. I do have a lot of faith in the Packers. Is that the faith you're talking about? Probably not. But my faith formation started in the first Presbyterian church of Wyoiga, Wisconsin. The Wyoiga, Wisconsin is a town just over a thousand people at the time. It's grown a little bit. And Probably my grandmother and my mother were key personalities or leaders in the idea of my faith formation. My confirmation class at my Presbyterian church was five. I'm still connected actually to all five and uh, I know where they all are. We, we keep tabs on each other. And I also think of probably the rule, um, the, the, the overlying faith formation that probably was planted and seeded in my childhood was that golden rule of do unto others as they would have you do unto you. Is that right? Did I say that right? You know what I'm talking about. And as I look back now over um, the last few decades, uh, I think that has been a guiding factor in one way or another. So as I grew up in Mayawiga, graduated high school, um, decided to go to college and went to University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and thought I had no idea what I wanted to be. My mom was a nurse, so I thought, I'm going to go into nursing. Now, I didn't quite take, so I took a pretty hard turn and went from nursing to computer science. Now, I'm not sure that was a faith-based decision. It certainly isn't kind of aligned with helping people, but I immediately fell in love with technology, and I immediately started thinking, how can technology make people's lives better? 
And that's been a theme that has driven my entire career. Uh, how can technology make our lives better, easier, and help us connect with each other? I even, uh, when I was a student at Eau Claire, I was a student programmer and helped one of the professors uh, create a online test. That was pretty a hard edge way back then. And while I certainly made my professor's life easier, I'm not sure it made the student's life easier, but I got a taste of at least helping the professor. When I graduated, um, ended up on the East Coast for a couple of years, uh, kind of wandered through my career, but this recurring theme of how can I help people, how can I bring technology to people was a recurring theme. And um, it didn't always hone true. And in fact, I have this one kind of very specific point in my career that I, I'd like to tell a story about. And it was, I was back in the Twin Cities. I moved back from the East Coast to the Midwest, ended up in the Twin Cities and had my own consulting company and was doing turnkey software solutions and landed a client, a really good client. And in this client, was, it was a long project. I had to hire, hire extra help. It was strategically in line with what they want to do. It's everything you want to hope for in a project uh, for your consulting business. And about halfway through the project, I just lost all motivation for it. The client was the Association of Chicken Farmers. And the project was to analyze and test and create new mixtures for chicken feed. And I thought, chicken feed? What am I doing? And to this day, I call it my chicken feed epiphany. So after my chicken feed epiphany and after finishing the project, I really looked hard at the work I was accepting and doing. And right during this time, this was in the 90s, I, this little thing called the internet was taking off. And what fascinated me about the internet is how it goes directly to the person. So this is technology being able to directly connect to people. And the World Wide Web was born, the first World Wide Web page in 1993. And I was creating websites for all sorts of small businesses. I actually created websites for a number of churches and it was bringing people to get that information. And then a wow event happened in 1997. Two really good friends of mine, Joanne and Darren, were about 23 weeks into a pregnancy. And Joanne developed HELP syndrome, which is very serious for, of course, the baby and, a, and the mother. And unfortunately, the baby had to be born. So at 23 and a half weeks, their baby, Bridget, was born. And Joanne and Darren have this large group of friends and I asked, what can I do to help? And they said, can you call everyone? Let them know what's going on. And so I made two phone calls and thought there's gotta be a better way. And I thought, ah, a website. So in fact, the same day their baby Bridget was born, June 7th, 1997, the first Caring Bridge page was born. And immediately was this wow event of allowing not only Joanne and Darren and baby Bridget to connect to their friends and family and gather love and support from them, but allowed us to connect to Joanne and Darren. And you could just feel the love, the energy, the faith within that website. Bridget's life was this roller coaster nine days and unfortunately passed away. But from that inspiration, I became obsessed with the idea of Caring Bridge helping anyone that's going through a health journey. And in fact, Caring Bridge was named after Bridget, and I actually consider Caring Bridge Bridget's legacy. She would be 23 this year, and her legacy is amazing. And in fact, every five minutes, a new Caring Bridge site is created that brings that faith community, that love community, that friends and family community together. And that truly has been a faithful journey. The other thing that really has happened over the last 23 years for me personally is being able to bear witness to all these stories on Caring Bridge. Now, I don't follow all of them, but there certainly are stories that um, people I know that have used Caring Bridge or people that have told me their story. When I tell people I'm the founder of Caring Bridge, 
they tell me their story. And it is so special to me to hear these stories of, you know, courage, of faith, of love, of um, grief, but love, hope, and heartbreak. These are the stories that bind us. And these are the stories that where we really shine and show that we are connected as people, as humans, as people that are in the world helping each other out. I truly thought in the very beginning, this idea of social media, social networking, and you know, in 1997, none of the other social media, social networking was there. There was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no Google in 1997. And I was convinced that this is going to change the world. The idea that we can all be connected anywhere and everywhere that we wanna be is going to be, it's gonna bring the world closer together. Now we've seen a lot of platforms get a lot of negativity and my opinion has changed, but there is one shining island that continues to be a source of love and support and that's Caring Bridge. And part of it is very early on, I didn't want it to be driven by selling ads or selling data. The revenue dr driving wasn't the most important thing to me. So making Caring Bridge a nonprofit, I like to think of it as it's driven by love. And as families find the value of it, they want to use their charitable dollars to make sure Caring Bridge is there for other families. And people, and Caring Bridge is just there to, you know what you're there for. You're there to support your friends and family. And so it has really remained throughout 23 years of this crazy technology boon uh, around social media, social networking, internet. Uh, it has remained very true to the idea of we need to be connected to each other when we're going through these challenging times. And that has really, the last 23 years, really put my feet firm on the ground around the faith of how we have, as people can help and lift each other up. So I think that's my time. Uh, thanks for listening. And again, Andy, thanks for the invitation. Oh, and uh, go Pack Go. Good morning, St. John's. My name is Carla Haugen. I work in finance at Best Buy, and I appreciate being with you this morning. First of all, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Pastor Andy and Perry Furness. Number one, I believe this is a very important topic, and I'm excited that we're talking about it. Number two, nudging me, or should I say somewhat pushing me out of my comfort zone and getting me to do this. And finally, allowing me to learn from others. In particularly, I've really enjoyed Mike Max. I enjoyed his message about doing what you love. I think it's very important and you can't be successful without it. Number two, Dan Brown, thank you for your comments about being a lawyer. It was well said and I really enjoyed it. So with that, let's get on to this. So. How do I live out my faith through my career and the paths I have chosen? This is a tough topic for me. Early in my career, I really struggled with this question. In fact, I'd had downright guilt sometimes about it. I've, looked, I've worked for three large for-profit companies, all in finance or accounting. We weren't exactly always a beacon for the faith-filled life career choices. But when I sat down and really thought about it, it became a lot more clear. Number one, when I thought about more clear, noble professions in, that were noble to me, I thought of things like a nurse or healthcare, um, which is kind of funny because I was not a good science student and that was certainly not my calling. Number two, teaching. Again, a career that I truly respect and think we need more great teachers. But again, I'm not a patient person by nature and I wasn't even the best teacher to my own children. So neither one of those was the best choice for me. So as I prayed for it and I asked for guidance, um, I, I found a Bible verse that has become somewhat um, a guider for me throughout my life. It's Proverbs 3 verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. That has directed to me to continue to pray for guidance and stay close to my faith to allow me to move forward. And importantly, don't overthink things. 
As someone who's been trained in finance and accounting to follow facts, it allows me to stop overthinking and just trust and listen to the Lord. So obviously with that comes some responsibility and some parameters. Just because you're praying for, for guidance doesn't mean that you can make poor choices. So I've also got a few more things that have led me throughout my life. As I said, I'll keep saying, number one, pray for guidance. Number two, ensure you're happy with what you do because you cannot be successful without that. Number three, find organizations that align with your personal values and your morals. And then finally, influence that organization to continue to be better and to do well in the world. Now, some of you may say Best Buy, you work for a retailer, um, you sell stuff, you know, how does that really align? I will just say this much that I know this company strives to do better for the, ser the communities that we serve in and to use their power and resources to influ influence the world to be a better place. And that helps me to feel like I'm part of a good place that truly matters. So the second question, what key elements of God's presence in your life come through how you carry out your work, interact with people, look to the future, think about your priorities, and make an impact around the people around you? I think this comes down to, to a few things. Number one, willingly demonstrate your faith and your trust in God. Again, I can't say it enough, praying for guidance and consistently trusting in God for the future and not trusting on yourself or again, your own understanding. Next, I try to do this by remembering that the people around me is what really matters and how I treat them and how I live my day to day and the choices I make is what matters. And prioritizing the people around you is very important. I'm at a point in my career where I get to spend a lot of my time mentoring and teaching others. And I take it as a huge gift and I do not tread with it lightly. So how I treat those people and using the opportunities to continue to help others is very important to me. Finally, I find ways to utilize my skills to give back. I had the opportunity to serve as the church treasurer for um, several years, and it was um, a great way for me to utilize the skills that I had learned in corporate America to give back to our church congregation. I can tell you I was certainly a better treasurer than I was a Sunday school teacher, and much happier at it as well. So in summary, what do I do and how do I do it? Trust God. Utilize my unique God-given talents to do what I can to make this world a better place. Three, do what I love and do it well. Four, work in a place that makes it, oh, the world a better place. Prioritize helping others. And finally, find ways to give back. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor Andy, Perry, and Brooks for including me in your video. If I understand it right, you're asking me to share how I incorporated my work life with my faith and to share how I've come to believe what I believe. I'm Larry Schneiderman. My brother Russ and I bought what was a small but successful rural general store owned by our parents back in the mid 70s. They had absolutely nothing. I fell in love with the business when I started selling furniture at age 15. People buying furniture were happy, and if there were conflicts, problems could easily be resolved. I really looked forward to getting to the store each day, and though a lot has changed, I still felt that way 40 years later. I had no interest in retirement. Then in 2010, I was diagnosed to have Parkinson's disease. That changed my plans. I would continue to work, but my son Jason, who has worked for the several years at the company, would receive additional help and direction. My general philosophy works this way. People get into trouble when they live segmented lives. I'm a husband, father, and grandfather, a businessman, community activist, and a Christian. It's unnatural to say, don't bring your religion to the workplace. It's part of me and it goes where I go. I think the most common mistake people make in regards to faith is they underestimate the good that they can do for others. We look around, we see people in the news who seem to do so much. We don't even want to try. Recently, during our Tuesday Quarterbacks Bible study, the, the commentary quoted Mother Teresa, and she said, if you can't, if you can't feed 100 people, try serving one. Some never take that first step. You hear the saying, give until it hurts. I say, give until it feels good. Take the first step. 
Lately, I've been focusing on the gift of generosity. There's always someone who gives more than me, and I'm happy those people are out there because our lives, our giving together, can result in some wonderful things getting done. I am directed by the Great Commission. This has nothing to do with furniture sales. It's, it's far more important. What is known as the Great Commission is, of course, what Jesus said to his followers in Matthew 28. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the close of the earth. This indeed is our mission, and it scares the Jesus out of people. This too seems too big and makes us feel a little too little. I read somewhere, and with a little humor, there's one thing we believers hold in common with non-believers, and that is evangelism, or more specifically, fear of evangelism, that makes us feel uncomfortable as believers. And though we vaguely know we should participate, again, we are overwhelmed. Start out by inviting somebody to church or to be refreshed by the gospel or to bring their kids to Sunday school. Take that step. Probably the single most important growth in my faith occurred a long time ago when my brother-in-law invited me to attend the first Promise Keepers rally in Minneapolis with him. I wonder if there will ever be these types of mass concerts in the non-pandemic future. But there wasn't a major performer who didn't perform at the stadium there. As a point of reference, I happen to know that the second largest crowd was Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones because I was there. The biggest crowd ever at the Dome was the Promise Keepers, 68,447 men. I was on one of the three buses from northern Minnesota. The first day I was moved by a powerful message of faith in Jesus. The second day would be unforgettable, a road I would not turn back on. The Promise Keeper Band began the second day with a wonderful anthem, crowned him with many crowns. I got goosebumps, it's my favorite hymn. It's also my mother's favorite hymn. I was about 40 years old and I had begun to have some thoughts that I wasn't accomplishing much in life. Should I try to do something different to serve God better? Some friends thought I was having a midlife crisis. My brother-in-law was on my right, my closest friend on my left. A voice came to me and said simply, Larry, serve me as you do now through your work. I'm not really a very sentimental person, but I had tears running down my face. I heard it a second time and I prayed in response. Never since that day have I had any doubts that I was doing the right thing. Monday came and it's hard to keep that top of, mountain, top of the mountain high, but I had begun a lifelong journey. It started with reading the Bible every morning and then saying a little prayer every day before work praying that if I could help or encourage somebody for the Lord to direct me and show me. And I prayed at the end of, at the end of every day to thank God. And I remember what it, felt, what it felt like. It felt good. And when things didn't go so well, I could learn from them. Now I am retired. Friends often challenge me as to what work I may be doing at Schneiderman's. But honestly, I have no responsibilities there. And I guess I succeeded to a large extent in raising a son to buy the business from me. He's different from me in many ways, but in the end, he has great ethics and loves the business. So I'll take a little credit for that. I couldn't be prouder how he and the large number of dedicated employees make great things happen every single day. Sheila and I recently celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary, which I'm very proud of. I'm also very proud of our three children and our three grandchildren. I pray often that they will accept Jesus as their personal savior. This is an important part of my mission in life and I hope it's an important mission to you that you guide another person to greater faith and even bring them to know Christ. Man, I just can't believe how good it is to hear people talk about their faith stories. We've heard nine people in the last three weeks talk about how their faith is an integral part of who they are. 
not just a part of how they think about their work or, or even how they thought about what type of a career to enter when they were young people, but um, people who've just talked about how faith, the language of their faith, the language of God drives them and directs them and blesses them and guides them and gives them parameters and responsibilities and purpose and vision. And I just, I can't tell you how exciting that is for me as a pastor. That's just part of what I suppose excites us as pastors. So here's my little synthesis today. And first of all, I just want to thank all nine people who have been a part of this in the last three weeks, especially today, uh, Sana and Carla and Larry. Man, those were excellent exposés today. So here's just a quick little word on Sana. Sana, as you know, is the founder of Caring Bridge. You heard that, and I want to talk about that just a little bit. But she is also um, my oldest daughter's soon-to-be mother-in-law, about which I am thrilled because we are becoming great friends as well. And so Sana, other than that Packers stuff, we just may not, we might not be able to talk about that. <laughs> other than that, uh, I thank you so much for being a part of this this weekend. I'm going to go back to two things. It's the Chicken Feed Epiphany, which um, just is a wonderful story about how at some point, sometimes in our lives, something jogs us, jogs our, our minds and memories and makes us wonder things like, what on earth am I doing? And am I able to do something that seems more aligned with who I even was taught to be as a young kid? And then I'm going to go back, this is the second item, to that Presbyterian church in Wyoiga, Wisconsin, and how somehow clearly the message of the gospel got down into you like it does when we are parts of churches and it caused you to uh, crystallize your thinking around helping people. And as you said, finding those stories of love and hope and heartbreak. And know that those are the places where people are connected most deeply. And you put yourself in the, or in the nexus of those three things with Caring Bridge. And look what it has become. And I want to say thank you for that. Because on behalf of all kinds of people and the hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions we don't know who have benefited from that gift to our world. Uh, we are grateful. And so Sana, I, your words were wonderful today. Driven by love. Caring Bridge is driven by love. And if that doesn't come from the heart of Christ for us, I don't know where it comes from, even if people don't name it. So I'm going to thank you for so much today, and we don't have enough time to, uh, to, to uncover and, and think through all kinds of the things you said, but, um, but driven by love and finding ways to help people in that nexus of love, hope, and heartbreak was, I think, just really powerful for me, and I'm grateful. Carl Haugen, wonderful. I think one of the things, one of the red threads that comes through all of you today is that you all have been faithful people from the beginning of your lives. And I know that about Carla as well, an avid, regular churchgoer with your family, even now. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Carla, one of the things I heard you say is that you are aware of prioritizing people. And I really liked hearing that because I think ultimately when we prioritize people, it, we are letting our faith uh, drive us into places where uh, we know that God is going to be present in, when, in those times when we prioritize people. When we prioritize people, things like hope and help and love and joy and relationship and connection come out. And that's what Christ drives us to do calls us to do, calls us to be for one another. Never does Christ call us to be islands unto ourselves. And so I know in one, in one of your uh, sections in your, in your talk, Carly, you we talked about just searching for that right understanding of your career. 
And you talked about aligning yourself with an organization or corporation that mirrors your values and morals. And I appreciate that as well because it helps narrow the field and push, push away um, places and organizations and corporations that don't align with your values so that you can have a, a career that is filled with joy and, and, and a sense of, of purpose and fulfillment. The other thing you talked about was um, having a sense of responsibility and knowing that you had parameters and that the scriptures even guided you. Put all your faith in him and he will guide your path and show you the way. Make your path straight. And I appreciate that so much about you. When I was listening to your talk, Carla, the one little story from Martin Luther that came to mind for me was he was asked how you can be a Christian no matter what you do. And he said, let me um, say this. If you are a shoemaker, how do you become a Christian shoemaker? You make really good shoes. And in your work, Carla, you do everything so that it can be really good for the recipients of what you do. Thank you. And Larry, uh, what a wonderful statement and testament to your lifelong faith talking about how uh, your faith is a part of everything you do and everywhere you go. Well, I love that, of course, because if that isn't evangelism, I don't know what it is. If evangelism is letting Christ shine through us and sharing with people in whatever way we can the love of Christ, the power of Christ, the welcome of Christ, the hospitality of Christ, the openness of Christ, then that's what you've done. Your faith has been carried with you wherever you go and whatever you do. And then secondly, I just wanted to touch on your Promise Keepers experience. You maybe didn't know this, but I was there in that crowd of 68,447 people also. And now here we are, brothers in the faith at St. John's Lutheran. I remember that day, one final speaker telling us to finish strong. And I think in your words, I, I hear the sense of finishing strong, of continuing to live your faith, even in your retirement and in all the other ways that you are part of the community and the church and your family. Which finally brings me to those last little images of your grandchildren and how beautiful the life is that's bursting out from those uh, experiences. Thank you for sharing them with us. Everyone, thank you for sharing everything you have with us. It's been more than rich, and we are grateful. So at the end of this now, watch for a Zoom link so that next Sunday we can have a live discussion with any of you who is available and wants to participate, and I hope many of you will. Uh, watch for that link. You can also find it on our website, www.sjlcl.org. All right, everybody, God's rich blessings to you. Peace.